uh, meeting of 2024. Hope you enjoyed the lunch. <laughs> now we have uh, two hours in which we have two talks. And just remember, later we'll have the poster session outside, right, during the coffee break. So the first uh, talk today will be by Sayantan Majumdar of the Raman Research Institute and uh, of, of uh, Bengaluru, and he will talk about tuning the nature and positions of yielding or memory inducing <laughs> of yielding point in a colloidal glass. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to give a talk here. So I attended uh, another FRAC meet, I think, back in 2018, uh, pre-pandemic. So, so today, uh, I'd be telling you that how uh, this yielding behavior of a colloidal glass can be tuned uh, by uh, encoding memories. So what is yielding? So we are familiar that if we take a piece of material and we start applying some deformation. So for small deformation, the stress versus deformation response is linear. But uh, as we impose larger and larger deformation, like uh, it goes to the nonlinear regime where plasticity and failure in the material uh, takes place. Okay. So this nature of, uh, so the transition from this low strain elastic response to high uh, strain plastic response, this transition is called yielding. Okay, and there is, uh, depending on the nature of yielding, that uh, this yielding transition can be very abrupt, which is known as brittle yielding, and it uh, might be more continuous, and it is called, the material is called ductile, uh, based on how they yield. So, so how uh, materials yield, actually, like this yielding is, uh, in all material, uh, they have failures. So, this uh, crystalline materials actually uh, there is uh, well defined there are well defined defect points and um, the yielding typically starts from from these defects basically and for any uh, material actually the strength is determined by how uh, by the defects basically unless you treat the material because you never realize a uh, true strength of material unless all the defects are annealed in some sense. On the other hand, these amorphous solids like glassy materials and many other, uh, like uh, Sankar gave examples of granular materials, so, so they also definitely yield. But now, because of this structural disorder, it is very difficult to identify. It's a very active field of research that uh, are there identifiable precursor in the structure from where the yielding uh, will uh, yielding on material failure will take place. But yielding in amorphous material is extremely important from uh, material processing uh, from uh, from the point of view of uh, material processing industries and then uh, catastrophic natural phenomena like earthquake and landslide. So these are all failures and all the materials are uh, basically amorphous in nature. And few years back in our lab, uh, we uh, simulated, uh, experimentally uh, simulated earthquake-like uh, response below the yield stress of a material, okay, where you can see this uh, power law scaling of energy and so on. So, uh, so uh, this um, is yielding... Uh, Nature of yielding in amorphous solids, there are many uh, theoretical and numerical studies. So it is known that even if you don't change the composition of the material, so suppose you have a given set of particles and uh, with a given interaction. So uh, the question is, can you tune the yielding behavior of the material? So the answer is yes. And these studies, uh, there are uh, many other studies also. So, it has been shown that uh, the yielding, nature of yielding in uh, these materials, these amorphous materials can be tuned by degree of annealing. Okay? That means you can uh, precondition the material and make 
the material, uh, increasing the uh, yield strength of the material. So this is one example. This is a simulation study. So, so he had this uh, this broken line. This is the uh, this is a glass, and uh, it is a poorly annealed glass. So same glass, if you uh, anneal it, in this case uh, the uh, so this annealing, uh, this T is equal to 0.66, it is a well annealed glass and T is equal to 1 is a poorly annealed glass. So you can see that this poorly annealed glass uh, is continuously. As you increase the applied deformation, so this linear, it deviates from the linear region, but it happens in a continuous manner. Whereas for a, for same system, uh, if it is well annealed, then you see that it, uh, these two curves diverge very quickly and then it goes to a relatively high stress and then there is a uh, negative flow the deformation the slope drops so much more drastic so uh, so oil and yield sample uh, show abrupt or brittle like yielding and uh, this recent study also indicated that application of cyclic shear that you have a sample it has like uh, you make the sample it, it is let's say poor poorly annealed now you can apply repeated cyclic shear to make it uh, well annealed and it can uh, the yielding nature can change okay so now the question is how how it is achieved so they indicated uh, here that so they they are plotting the potential energy of the particle so what they do uh, so they apply a shear, like apply a shear, bring it back because it's a cyclic shear, and then they feel like uh, they minimize energy in each step. Now they uh, find the potential energy in the final configuration. Okay, so now as you anneal the system, actually this potential energy uh, goes to a lower and lower value. So the system becomes more stable actually as a function of annealing. And now, interestingly, what happens is, uh, if you start with a high potential energy state, let's say the system is poorly annealed, then you can apply a cyclic shear strain uh, of amplitude, this gamma max, uh, you vary that amplitude. So you see that uh, the potential energy actually uh, goes to lower and lower value before like the material yields then again as a function of strain like it uh, goes up again so for certain range of strain amplitude the poorly annealed state uh, can like uh, the poorly annealed initial state can be made uh, uh, better annealed but now for these curves uh, which are like already annealed uh, not by shear but uh, by some temperature preconditioning to reduce this energy very much, the shear doesn't have much effect. See, it remains flat and at some point it abruptly yields. Okay. And this is linked to the fact that how drastic the yielding will be. So this, for example, this green curve, you see that the yielding is like very abrupt. Whereas for these curves uh, at the top, like it is a sort of more continuous yielding. So now, uh, so can such training induced change in yielding behavior be uh, realized experimentally in colloidal glass? So we tried to search a lot, but we didn't find any uh, experimental system that clearly shows that this, this annealing changes the yielding behavior of the system. So then uh, we got interested in this problem. So, okay, so before I go to the next slide, so see, there are, I can see there are few problems, few uh, complexities, because like, uh, if you want to anneal the system uh, for experimental system under shear, I'm thinking about. So, there, there is no microscopic handle in my, I, will, I cannot reduce the part energy, potential energy of the particle because these are, uh, high degree of freedom sample there are millions of particles and you apply shear many of them will uh, like undergo some deformation store potential energy how do you optimize the system experimentally because experimental 
tunability for large system is basically at the boundary, like at macroscopic level. So that is one of the complexity. So we sort of uh, started this in a explore, exploratory manner that, okay, let's see what we get. Okay. But uh, actually, like, we are hopeful uh, for the following reason, that we also worked on this topic a little bit, that it is well known that, um, uh, like Shankar also uh, spoke about, that under uh, this global deformation, like, there is... Um, self-organized organization in the system and that can give rise to very striking effect like all the apparently looks like that everything is very random so this is an example of self-organization this has been a realized experimentally and so on although this is a numerical study so you have let's say uh, three particles okay and in a like viscous uh, highly viscous liquid so there is no uh, like uh, uh, the uh, dynamics is completely overdumped and these are also granular particles so they are non-brownian now imagine what will happen if i apply a shear field on that so because of the geometry these two particles will overlap because you have a velocity gradient in the system the top particle will move more and uh, velocity or like displacement gradient in this case so they, sh they should overlap actually because these particles will get displaced uh, relatively uh, little amount. Now the particles are rigid so they cannot overlap so there will be a collision and they, that will shift the position of the particle. Whereas this uh, guy, this one, like it will get displaced but it will not undergo any collision. Now imagine that dynamics is overturned. What happens if I bring it back? If I apply exactly like I have applied a shear and then I bring it back. Then for these guys since this overdamped hydrodynamics, it is reversible. So this guy will come back to the initial position, but not these two guys because they have been displaced due to collision. If there is no collision, they will come back to their initial state. Right? And now uh, what has been found is like we can mark that how many particles are becoming reverse, uh, irreversible uh, because they have undergone collision. So, uh, so they have shown that this black colored particle, those are active particles, active in the sense that they don't return to, uh, to their initial position. So initially for a given strain amplitude, there are many particles which are not returning. But if you do this experiment many, many, many times for a given strain amplitude, this is determined basically by volume fraction also. So you get to a steady state that where you have on an average almost equal number of collision. But now, what happens if you go to a lower strain value that Sankar also mentioned, you reach something called absorbing state. That these collisions, they go away with number of cycles and soon you go to a state up to this strain amplitude, there is no collision at all. So the system, uh, although it has like this uh, complex disorder, but it will self-organize itself to have no collision for this absorbing state and for larger strain to reach a steady state and you get a transition basically that uh, up to uh, uh, when this absorbing state to the steady state transition happens and this has been realized experimentally uh, for experimentally and numerically for uh, because the previous system i showed it is a semi-dilute non-brownian suspension where this collision picture will work but now it is a lot more complicated for amorphous solids because there is not really any collision because all the particles that there is long range correlation in the system so the disturbances propagate to large uh, uh, length scale so they are also actually by imposing cyclic shear you can actually reduce the these are troboscopic mean square displacement so you can reduce the troboscopic displacement of the particle that the, the system is sort of uh, reversible that some got to, uh, told about that the path of reversibility might be very complicated. It may not be like a uh, same path being followed uh, uh, in the upward uh, branch and bottom br uh, downward branch, but uh, still it can be reversible and it has been shown experimentally for this bubble raft system and this is uh, adhesive granular uh, material. So you can encode uh, uh, at specific amplitude, you can encode uh, memory in this system. So that was our guiding principle that maybe self-organization will do something. 
so this is the system we study so this is uh, this colloidal particle of uh, uh, pinipum okay so that is synthesized in our lab so in the dry condition the particle diameter is 0.43 uh, micron and um, in uh, so we make the glass by dispersing this particle in uh, water and in the uh, wet condition this particle diameter is 0.65 okay so these are like uh, brownian particle basically and the so this is little bit complicated i'll uh, i can discuss more later that i'm mostly we are in very high volume fraction regime but where the polymer weight fraction is 17 to 20 percent so we see similar result beyond um, uh, beyond a minimum of 15 weight percent polymer but actually it is little difficult to guess what is the volume fraction because of the fact that this is a hydrogel okay so the particles actually this polymer i'm talking about so the particles are like this that you see it's almost uh, spherical but actually it has these polymer strands and rest is water actually so the amount that 17 percent i'm talking about the weight of this polymer but the particle can like have a lot of water and it can uh, be actually uh, close to volume fraction one or even more than that because the particles are a bit uh, squishy. So, uh, okay, so this is the system. So, you uh, make uh, this colloidal glass. So, now what is the uh, experimental protocol? So, the protocol is simple. Uh, so, what we do we call this training and readout protocol that we load the sample uh, in a rheometer between two uh, plates uh, which is separated by a gap of like around 600 micron and then we apply these triangular pulses we can apply sinusoidal pulses also of a fixed amplitude uh, gamma t okay this is the training amplitude and we apply we precondition the system for six uh, typically 50 cycles in all cases and then we apply a larger pulse that we called a readout pulse just to see what is the effect of this uh, this cycling okay and uh, by this readout we are mostly interested in this upward branch of the curve because if you want to know about energy dissipation and all you can also consider the downward branch to uh, see the area under the curve and so on so this is the 28 percent sample so now this is the result so if you plot shear uh, stress versus shear strain for this material you get a very continuous yield right you, you have a very small linear regime and then soon it uh, uh, like yields go to this non-linear and plastic region but then what we did we apply a 10 percent training gamma t is 10 percent so you precondition the sample for 50 cycle with 10 percent and then we take a readout and you see that nature of the curve changes so it uh, becomes little steeper and there is a almost a signature of slightly negative slope then we train it by 15 uh, percent preconditioning then you see that actually the material like the yield point shifts towards higher strain and this is for 25 uh, percent training yes so, so looks like, yes. I, I just didn't understand the setup. Uh, is it a mono layer of this uh, sphere, so, or is it a pack? It's a three D system. So, if you, like, I can uh, move ahead and show the experimental setup. So, I have uh, just, yeah. So, this is the setup basically. So. You have like a, a top plate and bottom plate. Actually, it is a top plate is a like very small angle cone for a uh, for reason like uh, uh, just for stress homogeneity. But this one, this gap is around uh, five to six hundred micron, uh, and the particles are around uh, uh, six hundred nanometer. So you have it's a three D system basically. But uh, this gap is. Uh, smaller compared to this this dimension because the size of the plate is typically uh, 25 millimeter uh, radius mm -hmm. 
And the, the experiment it says it compression or extension? Ah, uh, it is shear. Ah, it's shear. Okay. Ah, sorry. So, yeah. So, you see uh, here, this Shia strain is mentioned. All right. So, now, uh, what do you see from here? The training makes yielding more abrupt because, see, it was like increasing and it is still increasing, but at a slower rate. But you see that these cases, like, actually it increases and then it start to come down. Okay. And larger training amplitude shifts the yielding points towards the larger strain. Okay. And it doesn't matter like if you do on the same sample or you load a new sample. It uh, doesn't matter. This uh, uh, this is uh, followed. So these are all the curves actually. I showed only a few. Like what you see that for very small uh, training amplitude, there is no effect. This, those curves are hiding behind this region. But uh, when, uh, okay, it is not clear from here, but okay, so I'll, so after like uh, around 4% training, like this uh, system responds, like you can see that there is a deviation and abrupt yielding, and then uh, these are defined training and readout amplitudes. So it is easy to see if I take a derivative uh, of shear stress with respect to shear strain. So the physical significance is it gives the differential shear modulus okay and you see that for untrained curve like we in this case we get almost exponential behavior because it is log linear plot but two percent there is hardly any effect it is hiding somewhere here but when you uh, train the system with four percent training you can see that it uh, it is here you get certain differential modulus but as soon as you cross four percent actually it starts to draw Okay, and then that happens for uh, any training amplitude, and I am I'm showing you just for three cases. Like for example, this fifteen percent, you see that this drastic drop happens right after fifteen uh, fifteen percent uh, strain. Uh, sorry for like mixing up this uh, percent and this absolute value. So the fifteen percent will be here. Okay. And then uh, this is 20% and 25%. You can see that uh, up to that amplitude, the differential modulus remains uh, very slowly varying, like it remains almost constant, but there is a uh, slight downward slope. But then as soon as you cross, your readout strain crosses that amplitude, then there is a drastic draw, okay, in all cases. So, and interesting thing is, uh, onset of yielding is same as the uh, training amplitude. It is not that it depends on that training amplitude. This is something I haven't found in any, uh, like, this uh, numerical studies also. Because they say that degree of annealing will determine, but, uh, like, this, I don't know, like, why such strong correlation is there. Looks like, like, whatever amplitude you train the system, you get the yielding right at that amplitude. And also like that drastic drop uh, that as indicating, uh, so that stress versus strain, it shows a negative slope basically. So if you take a derivative, then it becomes clear that uh, this after this, like there is a slight negative slope. So when you take a derivative, so you get a like negative value uh, that you can see if you plot in linear scale. It's the same data. So, and uh, these are like new experiments. So, uh, like we have most of the data for 17% sample, but like as showing the data for 20%. So, 17% sample, you also get the similar behavior, but here we have uh, for much larger training amplitude also. So, what I would like to point out is the following, that for uh, here also like for 17% sample, you get a continuous yielding for untrained sample. And you can train to uh, whatever amplitude you want. You get a drastic yielding. But now, if your training amplitude becomes really large, like for example, 35, 50%, you see that it becomes sort of, again, continuous. Right? Large training amplitude, actually, this abruptness goes away. And like here also, you get uh, same kind of data. Uh, so, 
if I uh, plot it this way, that differential shear modulus in y-axis and this is a linear scale. So what I was trying to point out, you can see clearly that definitely for a, a like intermediate train amplitude, you get the, uh, this drastic yielding, like where this uh, differential modulus drops very rapidly. But if your training amplitude gets larger and larger, you see that it uh, becomes uh, the slope decrease actually again. So both for smaller and larger training amplitudes, the yielding uh, becomes more continuous. And uh, so we can plot the slope of differential shear modulus, that is the second derivative of uh, sigma versus gamma curve. So now, actually here we have to draw some analogy because uh, what we are trying to point out that we don't have any uh, parameter that we can look into like uh, the potential energy or something that we don't know because there are millions of particles what is the uh, potential energy of the system. But now if we think um, uh, that which are oh, so quite hmm. No, it will not uh, go up. So, in the context of this, I was talking about the previous data. Huh? Ah, right. Where you show that, you know, it's going up, the, the differential modulus is going up as your reading uh, amplitude goes up. Uh -huh. But at some point, it should start to fall. Uh, no, uh, not actually this the differential modulus, actually. So, I read it actually one slide before, not even this slide. Yeah, this slide. This is where I was to... Uh -huh. So if you go to 25%, if you go to really still higher, what huh. up? So then, uh, like, see, up to, uh, after, uh, so for 20%, some, uh, 25% is the maximum that we have for 20%, uh, percent, 28% sample. So we see this drastic yielding, but I imagine, I don't know what is that limit, like maybe 40, 50, if you go, then like uh, this becomes less drastic actually. So differential modulus actually remains constant for all these uh, training. It is the, the point at which it is falling. So yield point is changing, but uh, see like here, except for the untrained case, the differential modulus, like it is all quite robust actually. It has a spread, but it is almost overlapping. So I had a similar question whether your driving is performed quasi statically or you can do the driving at some finite rate and still have similar results mm -hmm. so, so the, these are like quasi static experimentally realized like it is a very slow shear so it is like um, 0.01 per second so one percent strain is applied per second that is quite slow because only thing is uh, if you want to go very slow then uh, like then if you apply many many cycles then we are worried about the stability of the sample although like we uh, like uh, prevent evaporation by putting a thin oil layer but actually like very small rate with so many cycles if the experiments can run into uh, several hours so where we are not sure about the stability so that is our slowest rate and fast fastest uh, from 0 0.01 we have gone till 0.1, which is 10% per second. But over that range, the, there is no change, except for the fact that at higher rate, the data gets slightly noisy. But there is no trend. Thank you. Yeah. I asked about frequency is whether um uh, that time to relax and uh, con con you know has uh, come to some kind of st stable configuration yeah, yeah. if they come to a stable configuration then maybe your yield point can happen later i mean if you keep on say applying shear without allowing the system to relax because they have a long relaxation time whether there is any competition between the two which determines the final yeah, definitely, because uh, see, the, the relaxation is slow in this system because they are they are a gla glassy system, so and there is residual stress. So we we uh, did experiment uh, to uh, under step strain what is the relaxation time 
for 10,000 second, still there is residual stress in the system. But that is not necessarily coming from the interaction between the particles. So these particles have charged, they are charge stabilized, but uh, these effects, like if you uh, put some salt in water or something, there is there is no change as such. So this slowing down is like dynamic slowing down in glasses, not because of any long range interaction. That, uh, that can actually play a role, but not in this case. But this particle, I don't want to go into that, but these are little complicated system. These are thermoresponsive particles. So if you cross a temperature, uh, which is called LCST, uh, and for this particle, like it is around 32 degrees centigrade. So the particle undergo under uh, the particles undergo a transition to a smaller size. Actually, there is a like uh, the reduction of size. The dry, I told you that the dry particle size around 430 nanometer or something so it is actually they swell because the uh, polymers in uh, like they remain uh, soluble actually below that temperature but beyond that the hydrophobic domains open up and then there, there is a competition between hydrogen bonds and also particle uh, undergo some collapse state and they are actually very Interestingly, you can form a gel-like network because of like uh, this, but at this state where the polymers are soluble, there is no such thing. You can consider it to be typically hard sphere because with salt, there is no effect at all. So now here, uh, what I was trying to show that, uh, see, uh, so if we take a double derivative of the stress versus stress curve, uh, stress versus strain curve, what we get, it is the uh, variation of differential shear modulus. Okay, so what it gives is the following: that you, I, uh, I have shown you that, uh, and there are some questions also. That see, differential shear modulus before yielding, they have a pretty narrow spread actually, so they do not change. Only thing is, if you cross the training amplitude, uh, that triggers drastic yielding. So then it uh, falls very rapidly. So now, if we, if you look at the rapidity of this fall, what does it mean? So if I have a very stable system and that it, uh, like, as it yields, uh, the modulus falls very rapidly, means it's a very drast uh, drastic yielding actually. So this double derivative of uh, this curve, which will give you the single derivative of differential shear modulus, it will indicate that how drastic is your yielding, right? So now if we plot these slopes basically, so if you compute these slopes, they uh, in this region at least they look quite uh, quite similar. Uh, but if you plot them, you see that actually for there is a intermediate training uh, training amplitude in this case it is 15 percent where this drasticity of yielding is maximum that means you get like the magnitude is slope uh, magnitude of slope is maximum okay the yielding is more most drastic uh, either side like if you train it with higher amplitude or lower amplitude this uh, drasticity of yielding uh, decrease and we compare this car with this numerical result that uh, this is again potential energy per particle for a poorly annealed sample. You see that uh, for a specific strain amplitude, this uh, the sample is uh, a bit, uh, like best annealed actually at this point, and then the sample yields. So if you start with a well annealed sample, then this strain doesn't have much effect. It simply yields. That is this curve. So now we uh, what we thought that it makes sense that, okay, so if the sample is more stable or like you, uh, it is a lower potential energy, the yielding becomes more drastic. And experimentally, we can measure the drasticity of yielding. And looks like there is a sweet spot of amplitude where this yielding becomes more drastic. Either side, it, uh, it becomes uh, more continuous. So... So under cyclic uh, shear, the system gets maximally annealed at the yield strength. Uh, so this is how they define yield strength. This is an interesting point because 
so this can define a unique point for the system that is independent of the training. Because otherwise, given a system, I told you, first of all, the yielding is continuous. There is no well-defined yield point. Next, if you train the system, your training amplitude uh, becomes your yielding point, which is a variable. But now, what is the unique point in this system? Unique point in the, in the system is, uh, there is a point where the, uh, like, uh, the shear can maximally annul the system. That is uh, only unique point for this system as far as yielding is concerned. Now the question is, from some other measure, can we uh, know that uh, what is the range of strain that is uh, creating this drastic yielding in this system? So we found that, okay, so in this case, okay, so let me direct. So actually what we observe that the yielding is most effective between this 5% uh, and uh, around 30% strain. Beyond 30% like it becomes like uh, like really uh, saturated actually. It doesn't have much effect. So and for different system, these points actually lie in this. Uh, so this is the um, elastic and viscous modulus of the system uh, measured under, under oscillatory strain. So this range lies between this yield, yield point and the flow point of this material. Okay. So what is the significance of yield point? So this region is linear viscoelastic region. Uh, so linear region, if you apply a training of that amplitude, it doesn't have any effect. So it requires some amount of nonlinearity. So nonlinearity comes uh, just beyond these yield, uh, yield points. But now you can... You can increase the nonlinearity, but there is another pro point that is this G prime, G double prime crossover. That is the flow point beyond which the system becomes more fluid-like. So apparently, like if you cross this region and go to the fluid-like region, this training is again not very effective. So this is the sweet spot where you have to train the system, and apparently, like somewhere in the middle of this region, you can maximally annul the system. So, last uh, maybe five minutes I'll uh, spend. Uh, so, this is uh, the experimental setup I told you. Uh, now, we have been just mapping out stress versus strain data, but just to see what is going on in the sample. So, the sample, the particle being a hydrogel, it is completely transparent. So, we have to do some sophisticated imaging like fluorescent imaging or something to see anything. But... What we did, we seeded the system with uh, 3 micron tr uh, tracer particle, uh, polystyrene tracer particles, which are opaque, and we put only 1% polystyrene, and it, the rheological measurement it remains completely similar. So this is the experimental setup. So this is the, this is the boundary imaging, basically. So you have this bottom plate and uh, top cone, and both can be independently rotated, but we are operating the bottom plate. So you shine a diffuse light, uh, uh, LED light source, and then you observe the boundary uh, using a camera, uh, uh, camera fitted with a microscope objective. So this is the actual setup in our lab. And this is how the boundary imaging look like. You have this uh, top edge of the top cone or top plate here, and this is the bottom plate. And as, like as you deformed the system, here I am rotating the bottom plate only. And uh, this video, it is showing just last two uh, training pulses and a readout pulse. You can see that you uh, apply this shear and then you apply this readout. Okay. So using the, by tracking this particle, you can, uh, uh, using particle imaging velocimetry, you can map out the velocity profile in the system as a function of this height. Okay, so this is the gradient direction, basically. So distance from the moving blade. So my apologies because <laughs> these are new data, so we haven't converted to like physical units also. Like uh, these are still in uh, displacements in pixel and so on. So, so what I'd like to point out that this sample is trained uh, with 10% training amplitude, okay? And these velocity profiles, we, uh, we have high-speed camera, we take frames very high rate, we can have many frames. So now, so 
each of this color, this blue color, it is like uh, the velocity uh, is plotted uh, in the uh, as a function of distance from the mo moving plate for one percent strain, two percent. So as the plate moves with cons constant velocity, you develop some strain in the system, and we are plotting the velocity profiles at uh, increasing strain. So now you observe that in the blue region, the velocity profile remains almost linear. That there is a like uh, constant gradient in the system, okay. But there is this whitish region, and then uh, red region comes. And what is the special about uh, about this point is like this is when the system is uh, this readout strain is crossing the training amplitude, the ten percent when it is crossing. So you see that the linear profile actually soon uh, become very highly nonlinear actually as soon as you cross this 10% amplitude. So this 10 is white and from 11% onward, like it is red, you can see that uh, this is a highly nonlinear profile which is showing like uh, strong shear bending. You have very high uh, shear accumulated here, uh, whereas like a high strain rate accumulated here, here there is a low strain rate. So Drastic yielding is accompanied by strong non-affine deformation. So it is not like just only stress strain garb. This is reflecting in the velocity profile. And we can do little better. We have these uh, PIV vectors. What we did is the following. So this is the experimentally obtained vector profile. And now we define, we know the uh, plate velocity. So we can assume a linear profile and there is no slip boundary because it is a rough plate and we see from the uh, video also there is no slippage at the boundary. So we can construct an affine vector profile. Affine means it is a just a constant gradient. Okay. And then we can subtract from each other with a normalizing factor. So that will tell us that locally at what point they deviate from uh, affine deformation. And you see indeed that there are some hot spots in the system. Uh, and this delta ij, this parameter quantifies, quantifies the local non-affinity in the system. <coughs> because the velocity profile is kind of average non-affinity because they are average in this uh, flow direction. Okay, so uh, what uh, you are asking that, see for 10% training, if we quantify the local non-affinity, what happens? So uh, because 10% training up to 10%, like this remains almost linear and then there is drastic yielding. So if you look at this uh, local uh, non-affinity uh, non pa affinity parameter, basically they remain very, very similar up to 10% strain. Hardly any building up of non-affinity. But as soon as you cross 10%, you can see that there is accumulation of hot spots and soon like there is this uh, dra uh, drastic increase in uh, non-affine deformation okay and this you can control if you, if the training is 15 percent up to 15 nothing happens then it will come and for comparison if there is no prior training this uh, building up of non-affine deformation is very very gradual you can see that uh, here first maybe one percent three percent is slightly uh, more seven percent so because this is like sort of continuous yielding and the linear region basically maybe two, up to 2%, 3%. Beyond that, there is a uh, continuous yielding. But if you compare yielding uh, like non-affinity at any amplitude, for example, let's compare 15%. This is the same scale bar basically. So you can see that 15% with training is much more drastic actually. Because there the yielding is much more drastic as well. And we have uh, quantified, so these are also very like uh, that uh, by variance of delta ij parameter where we can uh, show that without training like the uh, the total non-affinity remains small but soon it builds up. Whereas for trained sample, the non-affinity builds up around training amplitude. And when you train it with very high amplitude, you're starting from the beginning, your non-affinity is high but then it remains at that level. But in the non-affine regime, I don't know like what this magnitude really means. So this, uh, we have to do more thinking. I'm not sure about this thing. So I'll conclude. Uh, 
so we experimentally demonstrate that cyclic shear can tune the nature of yielding in colloidal glass. The yield point is determined by training amplitude. This is something very new. I haven't seen it anywhere and uh, we don't understand why that is so. At an intermediate amplitude, the yielding becomes more abrupt. Like I told you, there is a sweet spot of strain where this uh, annealing is maximum. Abrupt yielding correlates with sudden non-affine deformation. So it is not only the stress-strain curve because we have to be careful that uh, the force response can vary uh, like for many reasons. So we have to back back it up with uh, like more quantification. Now, as far as future uh, direction goes, like there are few subtle points I don't want to bring it here, but maybe we can discuss is like in the context of multiple memory, because I told you that looks like... Um, you can maximally anneal the system. So suppose that was 15% amplitude, we maximally anneal the system. Now, the picture is like all the particles, the potential energy go to a, a like low, a, a very low value. So then, we, at that state, we started training it with a smaller amplitude. Okay. So then, if it is already potential energy is minimum, then if you perturb it... Uh, around that it should not minimize uh, further but looks like there is some effect that actually around that also you develop uh, something is evolving so I don't know how to think uh, maybe there is some interaction between the uh, addition residual interaction so that part is like you have to think more uh, so this is what maximally any sample can also undergo for that training at uh, small amplitude and so on uh, so all the experiments are done by my grad student, Maitri and uh, Obisek. And we thank Jatindran for SEM imaging of the sample. This is my group at RRI. And these are the current lab members. Like to acknowledge RRI and SERV for financial support. And thanks for your... Uh, those images we showed, right, the, towards the end. Mm -hmm. At what time step were they taken in the final readout ramp? So, time steps, uh, in terms of strain, it will be helpful. So, see, for example, this is for 10% strain. So, you take it at the peak value of the strain in the readout, is it? No. Uh, so, that, so, that is the question. So, now, actually, we have captured the images at a faster rate. But now, what you are seeing, like either this image or like these images, like that is captured in the following way. So, Let's say, let's just talk about the readout. So now, after the training is done, we capture many images. So now at each strain, because 10% is somewhere here. So after 1%, so this velocity is constructed for 1% strain. So in between, we can have like, depending on the frame rate, 5, 6 images. So that you... So that's if done in one data set, basically. This is from one data set from different images. Uh, uh, different images, one data set. But you see. it is continuously like this. So, readout peak will happen somewhere later. But we are interested. So, readout peak will be after 19 actually. But we are interested that as we map out the velocity, what happens as soon as this readout crosses the training amplitude. And just to follow up to that, um, on the micro scale, are these particles free to move around or what is their dynamics like? Or so, uh, yeah. How is this, this strain is... encoded in the microstructure, right? Of the... Oh, okay. So that is not <laughs> that is not clear. So particles actually, if you make a dilute solution, they are Brownian. There is no long range interaction in this condition. But now we are talking about very high volume fraction. So the volume fraction can be like close to hundred percent actually, because these are squeezy particles. Because uh, we how we made that estimate is the following. That suppose you make a suspension of this particle and we know that uh, you can uh, like for a dilute system you can image how much they uh, fill up but now you see that up to seven eight nine percent nine eight percent polymer uh, there is no elasticity in the system so there is no system spanning percolation but if you go close to ten percent then you get a finite elastic modulus so I think that is the percolation threshold, which is like around 50%, 55%, like that. 
but now we are going almost 20 percent so double of that so that estimation will give that the volume fraction will be close to almost 100 percent they can be compressed but these effect even 15 percent sample you get similar effect but what you observe that as you go close to 20 percent beyond 20 percent should also be possible but it gets little difficult the the yielding becomes more and more drastic okay but the overall effect remains so question can i um, have the questions um i think um do you, do you have any information from numerical simulations that could provide what is the origin of this encoding of the training cycles? No. no. But because my feeling is that by doing these training cycles, you are leaving the particles in peculiar positions, which in the readout cycle will facilitate the sudden uh, displacement or the sudden shear of the sample. And, and this could be captured through numerical simulations. Yeah, that will be very interesting. No, it's... So there is another completely unrelated field, which is called shape memory alloys, no. if you are familiar, yeah, yeah. in which people there train their metallic samples mm -hmm. through mechanical cycles, tension compression cycles, for instance, or shear cycles also, in which the idea is to place the dislocations at particular sites through training so that afterwards the system will reproduce the shapes in a spontaneous manner, for instance, thermally or in, a, in other ways, okay? And then the, the whole idea is to place the defects uh, in particular sites through those training cycles. No? Oh. So this, well, uh, I think it's, it's very interesting talk. Oh, that's very really interesting, nice. actually, because I'm familiar, not the mechanical part, but the thermal part is uh, austenite to martensite. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yes. Uh, yeah, but uh, that will be very interesting and how, uh, because you only, these are not the actual particles also, these are stressor particles, so everything is like quite, uh, like we cannot see. Anything, you cannot see it. Is it to get some numerical, uh, insight from numerical. Definitely. Thank you very much. You said that, uh, is there, first of all, is there any aging effect if you make these, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the colloidal particles in aqueous solution, if you make them and keep it, does uh, it, it's, um, you know, by sure modulus? No, not for these particles, but there are like charged colloidal particles that... No, no, but uh, to form gel, they need some salt actually. And yes. and uh, first of all, they need some salt, and uh, you have to go to this volume fa beyond volume phase transition, so that LCST as uh, so there the particles develop some kind of like sticky interaction where you can see the strands of the particle, but below LCST because we are at room temperature, twenty five degree, here there is no aging, like it's a very very stable system. Okay, thanks. And just another point: How did you mix the uh, tracer particles, since you say that you are, uh, the shearing causes, you know, some kind of training already. So when you are putting the polystyrene beads, you would be mixing them, probably uh, you would be applying some kind of shear. Does yeah. it does it affect what you observe? Is there a, a hangover from the methodology yeah. itself? Yeah, because see, the, uh, like that, uh, yeah, it's a good point. So see, so to encode a memory, you need a very precise strain amplitude because all our samples are mixed by hand. So there is that's why they are not probably optimized. Uh, there are definitely memory effects, but that we cannot do anything about because that is the like uh, sample preparation history. Okay. So now uh, how we mix the tracer particle? You are right. Like if uh, on a on this glassy sample, it is very hard to mix the tracer. But what you do is like you mix the tracer particle first in the liquid, which makes a very dilute solution. Then you gradually add these particles. So then that ensures that it it is uniformly mixed also because glassy sample, if you try to mix, you will find that locally uh, there are like more particles, some particles are 
because you need a uniform coverage for a reliable PIV analytics. Yes. Yes, but in liquid, if you mix it, then it becomes uniform and on top of that, you form the glass. So then, then it remains uniform. Yes. 